Hi everybody, uh, Ross here again. We're back to our next chapter in the Abnormal Psychology section for Cambridge A-Levels Psychology. Yeah? This is coming from the 9990 syllabus. I'm going to be covering about bipolar and related disorders. Um, do keep in mind, this is just a general information, excuse me, this is just general information I'm going to be covering about the syllabus. Um, for the A2 level, you really need to read your own uh, materials, you need to go beyond the textbook slightly and actually make an effort to download the studies which have been mentioned in your syllabus, right? It's important to read those studies to understand it better and, and to go online and find other resources to supplement your learning as well uh, because in A2, you need to write a lot, right? The textbook is not going to be sufficient. You need to find information from other sources as well. Okay, so I usually ask my students, um, what is bipolar? Right? What does it mean to you? Think about it for a few seconds. What does bipolar mean to you? I mean, you've probably heard about it in the media, in the news. You may even have friends who suffer from bipolar, right? I have a personal friend who has bipolar and oftentimes um, we can see it clearly because he likes to post about it on Facebook and he always, you know, apologizes in advance when he feels his mood swings are coming on. Uh, but yeah, what, what do you understand from the word bipolar? What does it mean? I'm going to look at it in a bit more in detail. You can kind of um, guess from the name itself, right? Bi stands for two, right? Bi means two. Uni means one. Bi means two. And polar means sort of like um, two things which are in opposition to each other, right? So you can kind of understand what that means, right? Now, let's look at some of the characteristics of a bipolar um, diagnosis. Overall, people... <coughs> excuse me. Overall, people with bipolar suffer from an abnormality of affect. Now, the word affect... Um, in psychology refers to emotions, right? Affect. Uh, when you spell it with an A instead of an E in the front, um, and you're referring in psychological terms, we refer to it as emotions, okay? So emotions become amplified and they persist. Persist means they continue for a long period of time, right? Um, it's perfectly normal to feel some emotions, right? But in the case of a bipolar patient, that person feels it in an amplified way. It feels like more intense. It's not just brief periods of sad of joy, or, or excuse me, of sad or joy, right? Um, you know, um, these are the kinds of emotions that are so intense that they impair your normal functioning, right? So how long can you stay sad? Think about it, right? Uh, let's say, you, you know, it, I had a dog which died and I was sad for a few days. And then after my grieving, I get over it and I continue with my daily life, right? Um, that's what happens to most people on a normal daily basis, right? You do feel sad when bad things happen and then after you grieve, you get over it and you continue, right? Your mood goes back to uh, neutral or normal, right? But people with bipolar, they can remain intensely sad for long periods of time and then suddenly switch to intensely joyful for long periods of time, right? So it's a switch between the sad, very, very sad, depressed feelings and also the incredibly joyful, overly happy maniac, uh, mania feelings, right? So, um, it's normal to feel emotion, it's perfectly normal, but it becomes a problem when your emotion is so intense it prevents you, like let's say you're sad, incredibly sad for like two weeks at a time, you know, and you find it difficult to work, you wouldn't be able to hold a job and so on and so forth, right? In fact, even being too happy all the time can be very annoying for people around you as well. So in the DSM, right, as I mentioned before, the DSM is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual to help a psychiatrist um, diagnose people with disorders. You've got depressive disorders and bipolar and related disorders. Now, I talked about sadness and depression, right? That's a very key feature in bipolar, right? People who have um, um, depression might have bipolar as well. Um, although that being said, um, the DSM classifies them differently. And if you look here, one of the reasons is given here. At the bottom, huh? I'm going to read the uh, bottom. Oops, excuse me. Okay, so if you look here, it says bipolar and related disorders are separated from the depressive disorders in the DSM-5 and placed between the chapters on schizophrenia, spectrum, and other psychotic disorders and depressive disorders in recognition of their place as a bridge between the two diagnostic classes in terms of symptomology, family history, and genetics. So the reason why um, there is a lot of uh, shared similarities between bipolar and depression, right? Because people who have bipolar will also experience depression. The reason why... Um, they're classified differently is because they also have other symptoms along with that to classify them as a bipolar disorder, right? So don't get confused because oftentimes um, 
sometimes, okay, so let me rephrase it this way. In your A-level syllabus for 9990 psychology, you don't have a chapter on depression. Instead, you learn about the depression in bipolar, right? I hope that makes sense to you. Um, although depression can also exist as its own disorder, right? Uh, but for your syllabus, you learn about depression in the context of a bipolar disorder. So sometimes I've noticed questions in the exam, which will just say, explain the you know, uh, uh, things about depression. And students get confused because they're like, in their mind, they're like, no, I didn't have a chapter about depression. I only had schizophrenia, bipolar, and, and OCD and stuff like that. But actually, the depression comes under bipolar. Okay. All right. So now, okay, then this is why I, I explained that before this slide. So there's unipolar depression and there's bipolar, which is a switch between mania and depression, right? So unipolar depression, as I mentioned earlier, the word bi means two, uni means one. So unipolar means only on one end, which is the depression end. Bipolar means on two ends, from depression to mania. Mania here means, uh, it's basically a simple way of saying someone who's overly happy, too intensely happy to be normal, right? So let's look at some of the uh, symptoms, right? So people who suffer from unipolar depression, right? Um, Long periods of sadness and despair, pretty straightforward there. Loss of interest in enjoyable activities, right? Things which used to bring you happiness and joy, suddenly you just don't feel interested anymore. Struggling to concentrate, uh, feeling with withdrawing from activities of friends. Also, I've had friends with depression who often withdraw from social activities. When I ask them out for dinner or for a meal, they refuse to go out, you know, when they used to in the past. Uh, fatigue is normal. Difficulty in making decisions, right? Changes in appetite or sleeping patterns. Uh, feeling suicidal, right? wanting to commit suicide. So again, you may have experienced some of this in your own life when you've gone through a very difficult phase in life, right? You go through a breakup, you go through a death in the family. You may actually have some of these symptoms. Does that mean you have depression? No, right? Depression it can only be uh, diagnosed by a licensed clinical professional, right? Please don't try and diagnose yourself, even though you may share some of these symptoms, right? For most people without mental disorders, these feelings of sadness come and they go. They may come again and then they go again, right? It's only classified as depression. If I'm not mistaken, if it's like very intense for six months or so. Uh, I could be wrong on that, as far as I remember. Okay, what about mania? Okay, mania it looks like this. Long periods of euphoria, right? Extreme happiness and that high feeling of being super happy, right? But you can also go into rage and irritability, right? That can also be a characteristic. Easily distracted, having racing thoughts, right? Too much activity going on in the brain suddenly you have new interests you want to go skydiving you want to go rock climbing and you've never had these interests before and all of a sudden you have all these new interests all over, all over the place overconfidence in your abilities right speaking too quickly sleeping less or not even needing sleep right people who have mania they're just so full of pumped up energy that they don't even need to sleep right uh, also engaging in very risky behaviors right because you're just so confident in whatever you can do you suddenly decide to do all these risky risky things so these can be characteristics of mania right now um, major depression or unipolar depression so as i said earlier sometimes you might see these words interchanged right major depression is its own disorder that comes under depressive disorders right uh, sometimes it's called unipolar which, one, which, which is what confuses students sometimes about, huh? unipolar bipolar which one is it right so just to clarify again you can read more about it online when you see someone saying that they've got major depression a synonym for that is unipolar depression right so it's it's almost exactly the same thing or it pretty much is the same thing actually it's not almost exactly it is the same thing it's just that sometimes uh, people when they have mania symptoms together with their depression then we reclassify them as having bipolar Right, because they switch between mania and depression. If someone's only showing depression symptoms, then we usually say they have major depression. Sometimes people call it unipolar depression. Okay, so now there are actually th uh, three different um, subcategories under bipolar. There's bipolar one, bipolar two, and cyclothymia. Right. Uh, of course, there are other categories according to the DSM, but these are the three common ones that you'll see. Right. So what's the difference between them? Right. Um, bipolar one. If a person is classified having bipolar one, they must have mania. Mania must be present as part of their symptoms. Now, they might have what is also known as hypomania. Hypomania is basically mania, but a, um, a, a reduced form, right? So it's not as intense, right? It's still manic, manic symptoms, but it's not as intense as mania. And they also might have major depression. What does that mean? Now, this can be a bit confusing uh, because students will say, uh, Mr. Ross, I thought you said if someone has bipolar, they must have mania and then depression. 
Yes, in general, yes. However, in bipolar 1, what's interesting is that the first symptom that the, they're usually looking for is mania. Do you have mania? Okay, you've probably got bipolar 1. Why is it depression might be present, only might instead of must? Reason being because it's possible that this person hasn't experienced the depression episode yet. Now, if you think about the human body, the human body can only sustain things for a certain amount of time, right? Your body will get tired, right? If you're experiencing mania for a month, right? The following month, you'll probably crash, right? And during that crash is when you'll go into depression, right? So a person with bipolar 1 may not have experienced the crash yet, which is why sometimes they say that they might have major depression, but it's not a necessity to classify them as having bipolar 1 yet. Although generally, you know, when you think about it logically, if a person has mania for a long period of time, most likely that they will crash. Okay. What about bipolar 2? Bipolar 2, you must have hypomania. So this, the, is, this is the reduced form of mania. It's not so intense. And you also must have major depression. So bipolar 2, I think, would be commonly what we consider the, uh, bipolar in general. They must have a bit of mania symptoms and they must have some uh, major, depression, major depression as well. Cyclothymia is that you have some hypomania systems and you ask, excuse me, hypomania symptoms and some major depression symptoms. So it's not as intense in the sense that you don't fulfill all the symptoms, you just have a little bit, right? So if you have a little bit of each, then you're usually classified as having cyclothymia, which is probably a, uh, a less intense version of bipolar. Okay? And there are other categories as well, but these are three uh, common ones. Okay, so how do you measure depression, right? You want to make sure these people, do they have depression, do they not have depression? You need to measure it, right? Whenever we talk about psychological concepts, we need to measure them so that we can evaluate, so that we can um, be sure about whether or not we're classifying people accurately, right? So measuring depression, a very common um, scale that's used is called the Beck's Depression Inventory. This is possibly the most popular scale that I've seen. Um, it's called BDI for short. If you see BDI, it usually refers to one thing and one thing only, which is Beck's Depression Inventory. So there are 21 different items in this inventory. It is a type of self-report, right? So there are statements and then you respond to it. Um, self-report means you do it on your own, right? Um, this is not something that the that you need a therapist to guide you through. It's a fairly straightforward um, um, inventory. And they are basically giving you items um, which feature characteristics of depression with regards to attitudes as well as symptoms, right? So um, I don't think I put a, I'm not sure if I put a sample of the BDI. I've actually used the BDI in research um, before and you can actually very, very easily find it online as well, right? I don't think I put it in my slides. Uh, let me see what's the next slide. Okay, oh yeah, so to, to, to explain the difference between uh, an, an attitude of depression and a symptom of depression would look like this, right? Um, an attitude is a feeling of hopelessness, right? Do you feel like the, uh, everything is hopeless in your life? Something along those lines, right? And that would be an attitude that's related to depression, okay? Whereas, a um, symptom of depression would be something like, do you feel tired every day, right? So that would be a symptom, right? You are suffering from a symptom, whereas an attitude is something usually in your head, right? So hopelessness, do you feel hopeless every day? Some examples from the BDI um, would be things like, I do not feel sad, I feel sad. I am sad all the time and I can't snap out of it. I am so sad and unhappy that I can't stand it, right? So you would mark on the scale, which one of those uh, statements uh, relates to you the most, right, in terms of sadness. Okay. So if you have mild depression, you would get a score between 8, 11 to 16, uh, moderate depression between 21 to 30, and severe depression between 31 to 40, right? These values do change depending on the researcher that you're looking at, but that's just a general guideline, okay? What about updates? Yes, the BDI scale has actually been updated, okay? Um, there's BDI 2, second version, I think, BDI 2 and stuff like that. So, um, you can actually read about this more online. In fact, I encourage my students to go and read the scale online. You will find sometimes in exams that you will be asked to give some examples of items from the BDI scale. So you should memorize one to two items at least so that you can answer and give them as examples in the A2 level exam. Remember I said A2 is all about reading, you know, more just beyond your syllabus, right? Your syllabus may not spell out for you, okay, make sure you go and see the BDI scale and memorize items, but I'm telling you from my experience as a lecturer, that's really good, right? It helps you in your exams. So please go and find the scale online and read it for yourself. 
again, if you do the scale and you find that you fulfill the symptoms, please do not self-diagnose yourself. That would be the wrong thing to do. Go and consult a licensed clinical professional. Okay. Oh, so I did put some of the scale here, right? So the inventory can be self-scored. The scoring scale is at the end of the questionnaire. So 0 to 3, 0 to 3, 0 to 3 for all the items, 21 of them, right? So the first one's about sadness. Second one is I'm discouraged about the future, right? It's hopeless. Third one, uh, seven, number 17 is that I get more tired. So tired, remember tiredness. That's a symptom. Hopelessness is the attitude. 18, my appetite is a worse. I have no appetite at all. That's again a symptom. Haven't lost much weight. That's a symptom, right? Okay. So make sure you go and read the scale. And what you should also do as extra learning is to find out the reliability of the scale. Is it reliable? I can safely say, yes, it is reliable, but you should read more about it. Is it valid? Yes, it is valid. It's one of the most widely tested scales for reliability and validity um, in the world, right? Is it quantitative? What do you think? When you look at the numbers there, 0 to 3, are those quantitative or qualitative data? That is quantitative data, right? Because it's in numerical form. Secondly, is it objective or is it subjective? What do you think? Everything's in numerical form, but is it objective or is it subjective? Now here you, you may be able to argue for both sides. Personally, I would say it's actually more towards being subjective. The reason why is simply because this is a self-report, right? I'm giving my own subjective opinion, right? Um, it's not like standing on a weighing scale. A weighing scale doesn't care about my opinion. A weighing scale will tell me exactly my, what my weight is in kilogram units, right? That's something that's purely objective. But in this case, there's a bit of subjectivity, right? I get to decide what I want to answer. Now, that being said, um, in A-level syllabus, usually I've noticed that quantitative items or scales tend to be classified as objective, right? That's usually the understanding that I get from your A-level syllabus. I don't fully agree with this. There is a certain extent to it, right? Because it is numerical form, so you can claim, you can make a case that it is objective data, right? In the sense that it's all numbers. But that being said, uh, behind those objective numbers is actually a subjective person offering their personal biased opinion, right? Everybody's opinion is biased. It's subjective by nature. Now, you can argue this. I'm not going to go into the details of it. For your A-level syllabus, usually it's considered objective. But personally, um, from my own experience in psychology, I would personally call this uh, more towards subjective, right? But is it quantitative or qualitative? 100% quantitative, right? There's no argument there. Now, how do you measure mania? We talked about depression. What about mania? Now, there are actually a lot of mania scales um, that I found, right? There's Young Mania Rating Scale, Batch Raphael, Raphaelson Mania Rating Scale, Schedule for Effective Disorders and Schizophrenia Change, Version Mania Subscale, Altman Self Rating Mania Scale, Self Report Manning Inventory. Lots of them, right? And um, each of them done differently. Some of them are done as a clini uh, clinician interview. So if you look at the first one, I'm going to use the first one as an example, right? Young Mania Rating Scale, primary setting is treatment trials. Format is in a, a clinician interview format. It's a brief 15 to 30 minute, 30 minute interview. Covers most but not all manic symptoms publicly available, right? So this is, anybody can go and access the scale, but it needs to be done by a licensed clinician, right? You can't do it as a self-report. Unlike the last two scales, can you see the self-report manic inventory? That's a self-report similar to the BDI. You can complete it on your own at home. It doesn't need you to be next to a clinician. They don't need to interview you, right? Whereas for the first one, Young Meteor Rating Scale, they do need to. Right? Now, this is an example of the Young Mania Rating Scale, right? Elevated mode, 0 to 4. Absent, mildly or possibly increased questioning, uh, definitive, subjective elevation, optimistic, self-confident, cheerful, appropriate. Right, so this isn't really like the BDI where it's a statement and you agree or disagree with statement and circle accordingly. This is more like um, characteristics that are there. The clinician, right? Let's say I'm the clinician, I'll be interviewing you and I'll say, okay, how do you feel every day about your... Uh, uh, emotions, what do you feel about your mood, how do you, uh, you know, approach lines, and, stuff like that. and based on your replies, I will select the most appropriate um, um, elevated mood um, um, category for yourself, it's between 0 to 4, right? Increased motor activity, energy, sexual interest, and so on and so forth, right? This is just three examples. There are, the scale is longer. I forgot how many items there are, but, you know, the whole interview takes about 15 to 30 minutes, okay? So you looked at how you measure it, we looked at the characteristics, now we want to look at the explanations. Why do people get depression, right? So uh, there are three given explanations as part of your syllabus, biological, cognitive, and learned helplessness. Now, let's look at this, this interesting concept first and foremost for concordance. This comes under biological, right? Concordance is how, um, 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 what's the word for it? It's how consistent something is um, within, you know, within a research sample, right? For example, dizygotic twins, monozygotic twins, and first-degree relatives. Um, let me explain first now. 
dizygotic twins are twins that are born from two different eggs which are fertilized at the same time, right? So they share 50% similarity of genetic material. Monozygotic twins come from the same egg which splits, so it's about almost 100% similar genetic material. And then lastly, uh, lastly, a first degree relative is someone who is either, if it's yourself, it's the relationship between you and your parents, if it's yourself, it's the relationship between you and your siblings, or if you are married, it's the relationship between you and your child, right? That's a first degree relative, means that that's one person only one degree away from you, either above you, your parents, beside you, your siblings, or below you, your children, right? So with all of this, we want to see what is the concordance of bipolar. That means that if one person gets bipolar, what's the likelihood that the other person might get it, right? So amongst dizygotic twins who share about 50% of their genetic material, there's about a 12% concordance, right? According to Kel Soe uh, in 1997. You might find different um, values from different researchers, but we'll just use this for an example. Okay, monozygotic twins share a higher concordance, so if one twin gets it, there's a 60% chance the other twin is most likely going to get it as well, right? A much higher than the 12%. What does that automatically prove to us, right? It shows us evidence that twins that share, uh, that, 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 that there's possibly a genetic link to having bipolar, right? Because twins that share more genetic material seem to have a higher likelihood of developing it. Twins who share less genetic material, less likelihood of developing it, right? So that shows that there's some biological genetic link to bipolar, right? What about first degree relatives? Uh, there's a 9% likelihood if someone, some pers oh, sorry, some one person, excuse me, that's a typo there. If someone has bipolar, there's a 9% chance that uh, one of their first degree relatives is likely to have bipolar, right? So for example, I have a friend who has bipolar, right? I won't say his name, but there's a possibility, 9% chance, so it's a very small possibility that either his parents, his siblings, or if in the future if he has a child, might also get bipolar. It's a very small percent, right? If he had a twin, right, a monozygotic twin, there would be a 60% chance that his twin would also get bipolar, right? But he doesn't have a twin, so I'm not sure. Right? So all of this basically tells us, points us towards the direction that there seems to be a genetic link to having bipolar, right? So Oruk et al. in 1997 had 42 participants, right, 25 female, 17 male, between the ages of 31 to 70 years old. They were all taken from psychiatric, psychiatric hospitals in Croatia. And, and, a, and they also had a control group of 40 people, right? Uh, they were matched for their age and sex. So for example, if they had, um, 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 you know, a, lo a lot of people, uh, on average, if they had, excuse me, not on average, I think they were matched for sex uh, age as well. So let's say if I had one 70-year-old participant who was a female, I would find a also a 70-year-old female who does not suffer from um, psychiatric issues, right, to match for age and sex, right, as part of the control group. And he did something uh, of DNA testing, right? He was looking for something called polymorphism in serotonin. Polymorphism is when, a, if I'm not mistaken, uh, do forgive me, I'm not a genetic scientist, but if I'm not mistaken, the layman understanding that I have is that when there's a difference in the way that a gene uh, possibly expresses itself, right? So although you and I may have the same gene for this particular thing, um, there's a difference in the way that the gene expresses itself, right? We call that polymorphism. Poly essentially means variety, right? variety of things, right? Uh, morphism is the way that, let me not go into the technical details, but morphism, I guess, is the, the forms that it can take, right? So a variety of forms that it can take in genes. Okay, now what he was looking for uh, was specifically these two genes, right? A transporter gene called 5-HTT and a receptor gene called 5-HTR2C. Right, so these are genes related to serotonin, right? Uh, excuse me, uh, yes. Um, and serotonin, um, you've got transporter and you've also got receptor. How do you remember it? Transporter is the one that only has T in the name and receptor has a little R in the name as well, okay? So now the question is, why these genes? Why are these genes important? Well, in past research, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, these genes, or rather issues with these genes, have been linked to bipolar characteristics, right? So he knows that if he looks at these two genes and he finds some problems there, the polymorphism in these genes for serotonin would link to bipolar, right? May result in bipolar. Now, so amongst these 42 participants, why did I put a star there? So how would you evaluate that, right? Um, it's not a huge sample size, right? 42 is not a very big sample size. It's decent, right? Usually the rule of thumb, I think, is about 30, you know, 30, 30 participants. Um, it's got 25 females, 70 males, so there's slight imbalance in the gender distribution. Uh, but you know, it's not terrible. It's still, I think it's fairly usable. 31 to 70 is a pretty good age range, right? There's a variety of ages there, so that's good. The control group were matched for age and sex, which is always a very good thing, right? 
remember, you always want your control group to be as similar as possible to the experimental group, right? So that you can test whether or not, you know, the IV that you're looking at or the criteria that you're looking at really does, um, you know, have an effect. Uh, polymorphism in serotonin. So he used a concept of DNA testing. Unlike other studies which may do survey methodology and stuff like that, DNA testing is very scientific, it's very rigid, it's very uh, valid, right? It's an extremely valid way to test for something because it's a scientific measure, right? DNA testing. It's, it's objective, it is um, um, quantitative, it is not, uh, uh, there's less bias involved, right? Uh, this is just a image of the human chromosome, right? So we've got our chromosomes there and we've got the 5-HTT is there, on the 17th chromosome, and the 5-HTR2C is on the X chromosome, right? And so the issue here, the issue here is that the X chromosome, right, um, think about it for a moment, right? Who has more X chromosomes in human beings, men or women? It's women, right? Women have more X chromosomes. Why? Because, because they have XX, right? They are XX in their genes. So there's more likelihood that they are probably at risk of the um, polymorphism of these genes, right? Because they they have more X chromosomes. Men, on the other hand, have XY, right? So there is a slight likelihood, but it's a lot, it's almost cut in by half. Okay, I'm just being general here, not necessarily a geneticist here, yeah? Next one. Okay, biological. Okay, results. Um, there were no significant differences between the bipolar group and control group in terms of the polymorphism of their serotonin genes, right? So, I mean, that shows that, you know, bipolar, control group, their serotonin genes are the same. So that's good, right? However, I mentioned a bit about females, right? So there was a slight significant difference. Um, of p equals to 0 0.049. So usually when we talk about significance, we want our p values to be less than 0 0.05. 0 0.049 is less than 0 0.05 by 0 0.001, right? So it's a slight significant difference, still acceptable, where he found that uh, bipolar females had more polymorphism in their genes compared to control females, right? So there's a slight significant difference. He looked at the genes in the bipolar group of females and the control group of females. He found that, you know what? there is slightly more polymorphism in the serotonin genes, right, for the bipolar females. Now, how do you interpret that? You could possibly interpret it this way, by saying that, you know, females um, with this polymorphism in the serotonin gene are slightly more prone to developing uh, bipolar compared to others, right? So if a female doesn't have the polymorphism in that serotonin gene, then they're less likely to develop bipolar, okay? What about the cognitive explanation? We looked at biological, look at genes. Let's look at cognitive by Beck. Remember Beck, our friend Beck, who invented the Beck's depression inventory? That's the one, right? Um, cognitive distortion, right? So um, cognitive is all about how we think, right? Cognition is about how we think and process the world around us, right? So if your thinking is distorted, right, and you have a negative view of reality, right? You think the world is terrible, hopeless, everything is going going downhill, right? This is known as an incorrect information processing, right? People who don't have a balanced view of reality might end up like this. Now, the opposite is just as bad, right? If you think that the world is full of rainbows and fairies and unicorns, that's equally as unrealistic, right? Having a realistic, mindful approach to the world, I would feel, I mean, in my opinion, would be the best way to approach the world. But if you think that every single thing is bad, that's incorrectly processing information, right? Now, this often becomes an automatic process. Right? Um, what do I mean by that? It means that some people have internalized all these negative thought processes that is just automatic. Don't even think about it, they're just negative all the time. Right? And this often happens in early life experiences and contributes to our developing of schemas. Right? Schemas is a very nice word in psychology. Um, I learned it when I was in my university. A schema, a very simple way of defining schema, is a mental framework by which you view the world. Right? It's something we develop in our childhood. As we grow up as children, we understand how to view the world in different scenarios. Right? For example, if you're going for a date, right? you're, going, you're taking someone out for a date, you view everything that happens in the date through different lens as compared to you know, taking your parents out for dinner. Right? The way your parents speak and the way your date speaks to you, you interpret things differently. Uh, 
every every move, every word, the tone of voice, the environment, right? You would see it from a different schema, right? Because you have a mental framework of how the world should operate in a certain position, right? Formal situation, casual situation, so on and so forth, right? So what is the schema? Yeah, that's basically it. Okay, so let's say you have a negative event in your life. Something bad happens, you go through a breakup. You have some underlying assumptions about how the world operates because you've internalized all these negative things about the world that everything is just bad you go through a breakup the whole world is a terrible a terrible place to be in and then you 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 then develop a negative bias for new events so you 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 don't want to go and you know go on dates you don't want to 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 to, to get into relationships with anyone because you have a negative bias you feel like no matter how often you try you're just going to fail 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 right so that's how it becomes depression right uh, they have uh, Beck, Beck came up with a cognitive triad of depression. So it's in three three different um, characteristics. The first one is having a excuse me, that's my dog barking excitedly. So she doesn't bark too much. Okay. So firstly, it's having a negative view about oneself, right? How you look at yourself. For example, a person might say, "I'm worthless," right? That's a view I have about myself, and then that then becomes a negative view about the world. Everybody hates me because I'm worthless, right? You extend that view, I'm worthless, now everybody else hates me because I'm worthless. And then what about the world? The world then becomes about the future, right? What do you think about the future? I'll never be good at anything because everybody hates me and I'm worthless, right? And so this triad will then, it's, a, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you believe you're worthless and everybody hates you because you're worthless and you can't ever achieve anything good in life because you're worthless, yes, the reason why you can't do it is because you're worthless. And, then, and it just goes in circle and circle and circle. Unless you break... The, the, the circle, um, it's very difficult. People who suffer from depression often have these depressive cycles going in their head. Right? Now, question. Uh, when do you feel helpless? What are some of the situations in your life that you have felt completely helpless? Right? Um, let me think of one. I remember the time that I remember feeling helpless was when I was trying to push a car that had stalled uh, on a hill and it was wet and the car was pushing me instead of me pushing the car and I would have been crushed if not for the fact that two passerbys jumped off their motorbikes and came to help me. So that was a pretty helpless situation. I wouldn't say I'm the strongest person on earth, but um, let's now talk about a famous experiment of learned helplessness, right? So this was by a uh, very uh, researcher named Martin Seligman. So he came up with this study to understand the concept of learned helplessness, right? He, he, he designed this experiment with a dog in two sections, right? On the floor of these two sections is a, a shock grid, right? So it, electricity would pass and give the dog a, a sharp shock, electric shock. And of course, if it's on the left side, the dog gets a shock, immediately the dog jumps to the right side. And then they shock it again and the dog jumps to the left side. Shock it again, jumps to the right side. So wherever the electric shock is experienced, the dog obviously doesn't like the electric shock and he can see the hole there and he jumps to the other side. The problem is, when there's electric shock on both sides, the dog can't escape the shock, the dog then, after a while, gives up and it learns to be helpless, right? And uh, of course, the experiment itself is more elaborate than this. The speakers are involved there. As you can see, the speakers play a sound and it's associated with the shocks and all that. I won't go into the details of it, but essentially, he, he used it to prove that in his experiment, dogs can learn to be helpless, right? That they, that they stop trying to escape the situation because they have learned that it is completely helpless. They can't escape a bad situation, right? And human beings have this similar problem, right? When we are put through so many bad circumstances in life, we, we believe in the false perception that we are helpless, right? We are never helpless. There's always a way to change a way you think about something. Now, so he called this learned helplessness, Seligman and his colleagues in 1960. It's when people can't escape a bad situation. You feel like you have a lack of control over the outcome, right? If I give you electric shock, no matter what you do, you still get electric shock. You feel like you've lost control, right? And so this is a link to attributional style, right? Um, what happens is that people go through life experiences, right? You grow up, you go through experiences in life, and it shapes your patterns of thinking, right? Your experiences shape your thinking, your thoughts, your personality, and who you are, right? So for example, you go through a difficult situation, you perceive the lack of control, right? And then you have a negative attribution, right? Now, this negative attribution can be uh, about the... Um, Internally, that you blame yourself, it can be stable, right? That this is something that's going to be bad forever, and it can be global. More things are going to go wrong in the future. For example, let's look. Yeah, let's use a very simple situation, like a. Um, uh, for example, let's say your dog died, right? Let's say you've got a pet, 
a dog or cat and it died, right? So it was a difficult situation because let's say your dog ran out the door and it got knocked by a car and it died, right? So you perceive the complete lack of control. Now it's not your fault, right? The car knocked your car, the car, excuse me, the car knocked your dog. I mean, it's not entirely your fault. Your fault is just that perhaps you didn't chain, chain the gate properly or you didn't leash your dog. So you, you felt like a complete lack of control and you could not save your dog's life. And you, you then attribute everything negatively by blaming yourself entirely, saying that it was all your fault, you're a terrible human being, right? Or it can be stable as well, that you say, I will never own another animal again because I just can't take care of animals, I'm just so incredibly irresponsible. And if I were to get an animal in the future globally, you can then say that I will, I will just be, you know, I, I will always forget and you, I will always end up with a dead pet. There's nothing I can do to stop this from happening and so on and so forth, right? So this is how learned helplessness can can, can happen in someone's thinking, right? Now, in 1998, he extended it further by seeing how how well attributional style could predict depression, right? So he wanted to see, um, for people who have these negative attributional styles, does it somehow predict depression, right? Can it possibly predict depression? Because people who have negative um, thought cycles tend to be depressed, right? So he tested 39 unipolar depressed patients, 12 bipolar disorder patients, and 10 control patients. He got them from outpatient clinics. Uh, they were a mixture of genders. Right? The mean age was 36. And he gave them the BDI, Beck's Depression Inventory, and the Attributional Style Questionnaire. Right? Uh, bipolar and unipolar, he found the results showed that they tended to be more negative and more pessimistic versus the control group, right? which is what you would expect to find. Right? But he just proved it you know, using this research. So people who suffer from bipolar, people who suffer from unipolar depression, they took the attribution questionnaire and they rated it more negatively. They were more negative and more pessimistic about the world, right, and life and themselves. And when they took the BDI, they had higher BDI scores, right? So this kind of shows a link between having a very negative view of the world and everything else in it, as well as having high levels of depression compared to the control group, right? Uh, he also found that uh, people who had unipolar depression plus therapy had, it had actually improved attribution and BDI, right? So that's good, right? Because it shows that therapy does help people with depression to improve their negative attributions. And when that happens, by some function, it seems to also um, improve their depression symptoms. So they reduce their depression in the BDI. Okay? What is the schema? Oh, sorry, I'm not sure why that appeared again. <coughs> Excuse me, appeared again. So you can do some, you know, your own research. Go and look at the VDI online. Go and look at the attributional style questionnaire online. Are they valid measures? Are they quantitative, qualitative? What are they, right? So go and find out more about that. Um, also, it's always good to have research that results in positive benefits to human beings, right? So it's good that when you have research that shows that therapy helps, that's always very good. It's useful. There's a useful application here where you can say that, hey, my research shows that this therapy is helpful. That's good, right? Okay. Uh, let's say, let's look, use, use an example. You meet a friend who compliments you on your appearance. Hey, Ross, you're looking really good today, right? So, for example, write down the major cause. Why do you feel like this person said this to you, right? Hey, Ross, I really like your hair. It's so beautiful and fluffy, right? Because I have an Afro hair, right? So, wh why do you think people, why do I think people say that? Ah, this person probably said it because I do look good. And my hair, I take care of my hair. I condition it and it looks good and all that. And then the second question is, is the cause of your friend's compliment due to something about you or something about other people or circumstances, right? So I decide whether or not I attribute it internally. If someone compliments me, do I feel that that compliment is something that is because of my internal characteristics, totally due to me, right? Yeah, if people say my hair is good, I would say it's totally due to me. Or do I believe it's because of other circumstances, right? That will be a more, more towards the negative attribution, right? In the future, when you are with your friend, or it says fiend, friend, uh, will this cause again be present? So do I believe that it's uh, stable? Will it always be there over time, right? Do I believe that I'm only looking good today or do I, will I continue to look good tomorrow and in the future? Yes, I do. I will mark seven. Globally, is the cause something that just affects interacting with friends or does it also influence other areas of your life, right? Taking care of my hair, making sure I look good, influences other situations or do I believe that it influences only in that one circumstance that person wanted to compliment me that under no other circumstances am I ever going to be complimented about my hair I don't believe that I would have marked seven so you know that shows you a difference in attributional style are people more positive or negative let's go to treatments so we've looked at causes we've looked at the characteristics we've looked at everything else now let's look at how we treat bipolar and 
Now, we definitely for depression, the main major treatment would be antidepressants, right? We've got two um, um, uh, primary drugs, the MAOI car uh, category of drugs and the SSRI, okay? MAOI stands for monoamine oxidase inhibitors. SSRI stands for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, right? So just looking at the words themselves, we should be able to work out how they work, right? So let's look at the first one, MAOI, monoamine oxidase. Even if you don't know what they are, you can just guess that basically it's a type of, you know, probably a type of neurotransmitter or chemical in the brain, monoamine oxidase. Inhibitors, what does the word inhibitor mean? It inhibit, in English, means to prevent something from happening, to stop something from working. So when I say it's a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, what do I understand from that? It stops this monoamine oxidase from working properly, right? So it inhibits this enzyme. So monoamine oxidase is a type of enzyme, right? It's an inhibitor because it stops the enzyme from doing what it's supposed to do. What do enzymes, enzymes do? They break down things, right? So it's stopping something from breaking something else down. So let's look at SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. What does that mean? So there's a new word there, it says reuptake. Selective serotonin means it selects serotonin. Okay, so we understand serotonin is a neurotransmitter. Reuptake, so when serotonin is taken back up into the into the neurotra into the neurons, inhibitor means it stops it from going back up. Right? So if, if things are supposed to be taken back up again, this stops it from happening. Right? So it inhibits the reuptake. Okay, I'll explain that later on. Okay, so MAY affects several neurotransmitters such as norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine, right? So this enzyme monoamine oxidase affects these three different transmitters by, in, when you inhibit the enzyme, means that this enzyme will usually break down these uh, transmitters. When you inhibit it with the MAY, it stops the breakdown. So these transmitters are more, uh, more freely available in the brain, right? SSRI inhibits the reuptake of only one thing, which is serotonin, because it's selectively serotonin only. Right? So it prevents serotonin from being taken back up into the neuron. So what happens in our neurons when neurons fire neurotransmitters, the uh, one neuron will fire out the transmitter, the other neuron is supposed to um, receive it, and I think if I'm not mistaken, the remainder which is free floating around is then taken back up, so, um, or, or broken down, and so on. Right? So, but the SSRI prevents that reuptake from happening, it prevents the neurons from taking back up the serotonin. So, then, so, so in other words, there's more serotonin around in the brain neurons to have more activity, perhaps, okay? The MAOI is more potent, so it's more, more it, it's a stronger effect, and the SSRI has a less effect, less strong effect, right? Side effects on the MAOI are, of course, more because it's a more stronger effect, and it also affects uh, more neurotransmitters, so there's a more likelihood that it's going to affect people with side effects. The SSRI only targets one inhibit one neurotransmitter, so there's less chance for it to affect people, right? Less side effect. So here's a here's a chart, uh, I, think it, I believe this is called a Gantt chart, if I remember correctly. So the differences are uh, MAOIs are prescribed when others don't work, right? Because they're a lot stronger. So if the weaker one doesn't work, even the stronger one, it targets multiple neurotransmitters, it's more effective, but it also comes with more side effects. The SSRI is the more common uh, prescribed antidepressant because it only targets serotonin and although it's less effective um, compared to MAOIs, uh, it has less side effects, which is what some people want, right? Both are useful for treating depression and bipolar, right? So they both can be used. It's more noticeable, ah, okay, so um, uh, these treatments are more noticeable in moderate to severe patients. So people with moderate to severe bipolar or depression, they tend to respond better to genetic, uh, so not genetic treatments, biochemical treatments, right? People who have milder symptoms, uh, possibly would do better well, uh, better with uh, more, uh, with less biological treatments, right? So these are some of the neurotransmitters we have in our brain. Adrenaline, right, is a fight or flight neurotransmitter. Nor noradrenaline, which is about concentration. Dopamine is for pleasure. Serotonin is for mood. GABA is for calming. Acetylcholine is for learning. Glutamate is for memory. Endorphins are for euphoria and so on and so forth, right? The top half are all monoamines, right? So these are all monoamines on top. Adrenaline, noradrenaline, dopamine, serotonin. And these are the ones that the monoamine and oxidase inhibitors are affecting, right? Okay, what are some of the side effects? Now, both of them have side effects on MUIs. You've got nausea, dry mouth, drowsiness, headache, dizziness, insomnia, muscle twitches, and so on and so forth. Side effects of SSRS are also there, right? So they do have similar side effects like nausea, diarrhea, and so on and so forth. Uh, but it's usually less than the MUIs. 
Now, let's move on to another treatment, the, the most, the least favoured treatment that, in my opinion, electroconvulsive therapy. We looked at this in our previous chapter, right, of schizophrenia. Uh, what, let's recap. What is it about, right? In my opinion, ECT um, is, you know, putting electrical stimulation on the brain. It should be only used in a last resort, right? Um, short-term versus maintenance effect of drugs. Ah, okay. So, the effects of ECT tend to be short-term right versus uh, dr taking drugs which have a maintenance effect because you can take drugs for a long, long period of time uh, for you know two three four months and so on and so there's a higher level of maintenance whereas for ECT it tends to be very short term right do relapses happen yes they happen quite a lot right uh, I believe one researcher uh, Dirk X which how you pronounce that word uh, tested on 1,000 patients with unipolar and bipolar depression 50% of them had remission right so um yeah, let me just double check something on that. Right, so um, on one side it's good, 50% of them had remission, which means that the symptoms went down. But on the other side it's also bad because it's only 50%. It means the other 50% had, you know, had relapsed, their symptoms came back. Right? So that's not very good. Is ECT good overall? In my opinion, I think it should only be, as I said, a last, last, last resort, right? Um, reason being because it's it's got side effects, it can even result in death, memory loss, and so on and so forth. Unless you really don't respond to every single other treatment thrown at you, then perhaps consider ECT. It does have some positive effect, but not the first prescribed treatment, right? Let's look at cognitive restructuring. So back in 1979, talked about having talking therapy, right? Talking therapy is all about identifying illogical thinking and getting participants to change their thinking, right? Oftentimes, if you believe that depression is caused by cognitive thoughts, it means that you believe that the way that you think is what causes your depression, then you have to change the way you think, right? You have to spot, why are we thinking in these illogical ways? The whole world's going to end tomorrow. That's very illogical. There's no evidence for that, right? So when you challenge these people to change their thoughts, you can improve their depression, right? So it goes in sort of like this format. First, you explain to them the cognitive triad, okay? Hey, you know, why do you feel this way? Is it because of something about yourself, a negative view you have about the world, about the future, and so on and so forth, right? Second, you ask them to observe and record their irrational thoughts, right? Okay, so next time you feel like you're going into this negative spiral, I want you to write down your thoughts. What, what are the negative thoughts that you have, right? Observe them, record them. Understand the link between your thoughts, your effect, and your, your effect and your behavior, right? How do your thoughts affect your emotions, right? A effect is emotions, as I said earlier. How do they affect your behavior? If you believe that you are hopeless, how does that make you feel? How does that affect the way you behave in the world, right? Fourthly, um, you, you try to get them to catch their negative thoughts. So I often do this when I'm thinking about something and I start spiraling into negativity. I snap my fingers and I catch myself. Like, hey, Ross, stop thinking about these negative thoughts. Be mindful, right? Learn to, to look at, you know, be grateful about the things that you have. This, the world is not as bad as it seems. Things can get better, right? I can change the way I think about life, right? And lastly, you want to do a re-attribution and reframing, right? So instead of having this negative attribution, I attribute things in a more uh, mindful and neutral and, 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 and realistic way. For example, if I go through a breakup, instead of blaming myself as being completely hopeless, I also attribute it as like, okay, you know what? It's okay if we don't get get together. I can attribute the breakup to her having her own um, 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 her own personal choice and autonomy to decide to say no, and she felt we were not compatible. And that's okay. That doesn't mean I'm hopeless or it doesn't mean I'm a bad person. It doesn't mean I failed in any way. It just means we're not compatible. And I reframe the whole situation from being a hopeless romantic into someone that just could not match with someone else. And that's okay. I can go and look out for someone else in my future, right, as a partner, right. So having this ability to cognitively restructure is very positive for people, right? It helps people understand that the world is not as negative as a place as people might think, right? Not sure why I put all the four stars and one, two, three, four, five stars over there. But, um, you can probably research more about cognitive restructuring online, find out more about it, right? It's about helping people catch this uh, negative cycle to prevent them from constantly spiraling into depression. So Wilds et al. in 2013, he uh, used, uh, uh, did research on using cognitive restructuring when drugs are not working, right? So if people, as I said earlier, right, MAOIs and SSRI, those antidepressants, they work really well on people with moderate to severe depression, right? But if people have mild depression, 
um, or bipolar symptoms and they don't respond well to antidepressants, then you should try cognitive restructuring, see how that helps, right? So the design of the study was experimental, right? So that's good, it's a lot more um, controlled. A very big sample of 469 participants, um, they all had depression. The IV here is the treatment type and the levels was usual care or the usual care plus CBT, which is cognitive behavior therapy, right? So either the usual care, in this case, would be quote-unquote the control group, because I'm not adding anything to them, just leaving them as they are, plus I'm going to add uh, CBT to half of the group, right? So those in the usual plus the CBT group had better response and reduced symptoms of depression, right? So they responded well to treatment, and this shows that having a CBT element in the treatment helps, right? Having cognitive behavioral therapy which is all about cognitive restructuring and catching your bad thoughts to help them affect your behavior more positively. This is good. It's good to have CBT therapy. Let's look at another form of therapy called Rational Emotive Behavioral Therapy, REBT. I like this. This is by Albert Ellis. So it's based on the principles of Stoicism. Stoicism is this wonderful philosophy, right? It's all about, you know, you know being, you know, um, stoic. The word stoic in English often means a person who is very well well grounded, right? Even if there's a storm going on, they're not affected by it. I mean, they stand very firmly because they know who they are, they know where they stand, they're very confident, you know? You focus on the things you can control and accept what you can't. I think if everybody had this kind of mentality, they'd operate in the world a lot better, right? They wouldn't get offended easily, they wouldn't be um, so easily affected by bad things because you know that, okay, you know what? There are things I can control and if I can control them, I'll do something about it. If I can't control it, I'm not going to do anything about it. I can't control it. I just accept that that's what's happened, right? Let's say, for example, you plan a outing with your friends and it rains. You, you can't control the rain, right? So you accept that you can't control it. The rain happened. Our outing got cancelled. But what can you control? Okay, we can't go for the outing here. Let's plan something else. Let's go somewhere else. Let's do this indoors. Let's go and play games in, in our house. Something like that. You know what I mean? So you focus on what you can control rather than, oh my gosh, it rained. I'm a terrible party planner. I, I am a complete failure. You know, stuff like that. Okay, y you can't predict the rain entirely correct, can't, can't control it, you can't, you know, so accept it, it happened, and move on, focus on what you can control. So I think that's a very good way of looking through life, right? Um, depression is all about your internal constructions and your perceptions which are negative, which are inappropriate, that you believe, that, you know, as I said in the example earlier, you think everything is terrible and hopeless and, you know, out of your control and you can't control anything, right? So this uses the ABC model. A stands for an activating event. Let's say, for example, you failed a job interview, right? I've gone through that before where I've sent out resumes and I get rejected, right? So that's the activating event. Um, I failed a job interview, let's say. B is your beliefs about the event, right? I'll never get a job. I'm not good enough, right? I've sent out resumes to many companies before. I've never gotten hired by all of them, right? So sometimes I get rejected, right? And if I believe that I'm not good enough, I'll never get a job, that's the B. C is the consequences. So if I believe that, I might feel sad, I might feel angry, I might start crying, I might lash out at my family and friends, I might feel very angry as a person, I might withdraw from society, and I might end up never applying for a job again, right? Now, I know people who have applied for hundreds and hundreds of job applications, and then they find that one golden opportunity, right, after so many applications, right? So, but if I believe that I'm never going to be good enough, I may never apply again. And that's not good, right? That's a very negative way of looking at the world. Right? I focus on what I can control. I can constantly apply, uh, uh, sorry, I can constantly improve on myself and apply and apply and apply. Except what I can't. Sometimes employers may not want me, right? That's not up to me to decide. And I don't feel sad anymore. I feel realistic about my situation, right? So this uh, is the, called the ABC model. Activating event, A. Beliefs about the event, B. And consequences, C. Uh, we won't be doing this, of course, this is for my own class where I ask them to design an ABC model for an event that happens in their life, you know, a breakup, a failed job interview, a uh, mistake that you made, something embarrassing that happened, right? You can do it on your own, right? You know, to help understand, you know, that when, when you start thinking about things negatively, right? If you break something, let's say you drop something in your house, you break it and you, oh my God, I'm so stupid, why am I? And then immediately take a pen and paper and start writing down. What was the event? Okay, I broke something. What is the belief I have? I'm so stupid. What are the consequences? I'm always going to believe that I'll break things in the future, right? So that helps you understand yourself better, catch your negative thoughts, and then apply principles of stoicism, right? Rational emotive behavioral therapy. Remind yourself that, hey, you know what? I'll focus on what I can control. I can control on being a better and more careful person. But I can't control the fact that you know accidents happen. 
I broke something. Right? In fact, you should actually go online and read more about REBT and how it helps people. Right? That'd be good. So the goal of REBT is to have a more constructive and rational thinking in the patient. Right? You want them to, to be more constructive in the way they think instead of depression and depressive. Right? You want to help them dispute. Uh, so you do a lot of disputing where you challenge them and you forcibly question their irrational beliefs. You, you drop the plate. How does that make you stupid? What does dropping a plate have to do with your intelligence? Are you sure? Really? Don't accidents happen there? Right? So I'm questioning someone's belief right, about something because it's irrational. Right? Just because you drop something or you fail something doesn't mean you're a failure. Right? Yes, you failed in a job interview, but that doesn't make you a failure. Right? Your job interview didn't go well, but that doesn't mean you as a person are completely hopeless. Right? So whatever happens, you can choose how you feel about it. Right? You have a choice in how you choose to feel. Right? In certain situations, you can choose how you want to attribute to a certain situation. Right? REBT focuses on the present. What's happening right now to you and how do you feel about it right now? Not about the past, your childhood, your experiences. It focuses on who you are today. Right? So Lyons and Woods, they did an experiment. They did a non-experiment, a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis is a type of study that takes hundreds and hundreds of other studies, takes all the data from those studies, puts them into one complete study. Right? So a meta-analysis is like a huge computation of many, many other studies together. Right? So they took 70 REBT studies and they did a comparison. Right? Uh, 236 um, was it participants, I think. Yeah, participants. Um, some of them were REBT participants versus other treatments. They found that participants who had REBT had significant improvements compared to other treatments. Right? So they took 70 different studies and they combined all of these studies, looked at them together, and said that, yes, in all of these studies in, in general, those who participated in REBT had significant improvements over other treatments. Right? Uh, so there's a video here I, uh, of an um, interview between a clinician and a participant. Right? And you can find interviews like this online and how the clinician brings this person through and questions them about their beliefs and so on. Uh, I won't play the video for this uh, uh, YouTube video. Okay, so let's look at some issues, debates, and approaches, which is also applicable to A2 level. I won't go in such depth into these because these can be take a lot of time. I may do them in future videos, but um, in general, let's talk about some applications to everyday life, right? So the BDI scale, for example, um, what are the strengths and weaknesses of the scale? Well, you know, as we discussed earlier, it's an um, um, it's a quantitative scale, so that's really good, right? It's quantitative, it's easy to compute, it's easy to measure over time, it's valid and reliable. But what are some of the weaknesses? Well, it's, you know, it's um, quantitative can also be a weakness, right? It's very limiting. What if a, pa a, a patient has something else they want to say, but it's not available in the list of options, right? Um, how we diagnose, how we treat, um, it can be adapted for younger, right? The BDI, I believe, has a child's version of the scale as well, right? Um, how our, our uh, diagnosis and treatment of depression, uh, what are the strengths and weaknesses that we can talk about, right, when it comes to diagnosing and treating depression, right? What about nature versus nurture? The Oruk et al. study about genetics, right? Uh, what do we believe about it? Does it show that, is it 100% nature? Could there be some nurture elements, right? Triggered by life events, you know? If some of the percentage of genetic variants does seem to account for bipolar, what about the other things? What about the other causes, right? Um, what can we say about drug treatments um, and electroconvulsive therapy? versus cognitive restructuring and REBT, which of these treatments are more towards nature, right? Obviously the drug treatments, which of these treatments support the nurture argument, usually the cognitive treatments, right? Because they don't have to deal with your biology, they just care about how you think. Whereas the drugs don't care about how you think about the world, they just deal with your biology, your neurotransmitters, right? You well, we can discuss that as well. Individual versus situational, right? When you're learn in, in a learned helplessness in a situation, is it an individual attribute or a situational attribute? You as a person individually, you believe that you're helpless. Or could it be that the situation has caused you to feel that way, right? So you can debate about that. What about having negative attributions? Is it individual or is it situational? Is it caused by the way that you look at the world? Or is it being caused by the way that the situation is around you? You can debate about that. Having a difficult childhood, right? Is that something that you decided as an individual? Or was it the situation around you, right? Not every, we don't choose where we're born in. Some people are born in good families. Some people are born in difficult families, right? Is that situational, individual? What do you think? What about neurotransmitters versus choosing to socially isolate yourself, right? Neurotransmitters tend to be individual, right? Biological, individual. You know, it's your, it's your own body. 
but if you choose to withdraw socially from others, you know, um, or people choose to ice, um, if you're socially isolated, is that situational? Is it individual? Right? What about reductionism? Right? Reductionism is one of the. Um, so in A2 level, you, you tend to go a little bit further. At your AS level, you talk about things like validity, reliability, individual situational, nature versus nurture. Um, for A2 level, you go to uh, wider concepts like reductionism, um, psychometrics, and stuff like that, which I will cover in future videos. Like, for example, genetics. Uh, reductionism, by the way, just means that you, um, you take something, you take any phenomenon or complex situation, and you reduce it to one way of thinking about it, right? Or one point of view. So that's why I call it reductionism. You reduce something. So it tends to be, in this case, if you, let's say, you're a researcher who only cares about the genetic explanation for depression, right? That's a very narrow explanation because you don't care about how people think. You don't care about their, their, their childhood. You don't care about their thought processes, right? So we say that that's a very reductionist way of looking at the world. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Maybe it's good because you want to focus on only one thing and improve and find therapies that help that one thing. But it can be also a, a disadvantage because you disregard people's history, you disregard people's thoughts, their emotions. Right? Why don't all relatives get a disorder? Right? So if you're only looking at the genetic explanation, it doesn't explain why other relatives sometimes don't get disorders. Right? Why do some twins or don't get don't get the same disorder? Right? So it's reductionist to think about genetics only because it doesn't explain other things that happen. Another word that you might find is the word deterministic, right? If you study a person's DNA and they say that, okay, your genes for serotonin are like this, and that means this is going to happen, right? It's very deterministic. It, it basically robs people of the free will to live a, a, a fully functioning life, right? If you tell a person, your DNA says this, you're going to have depression, right? That's very deterministic. You, you're, you're, you're claiming that DNA is 100% determining their behavior. Right, and their personality and so on. And not everybody likes that. Why? Because people want to be able to you know, think the way they think, operate the way they operate, right? do the things that they want to do. Right? So if you tell people that you're, you know, it's deterministic, you take away their free will. But at the same time, what if that even though their DNA says this, they can change the way they think? Right? So that can be more towards free will. Right? So I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you learned something new about bipolar and related disorders. As you can tell by now, A2 levels, uh, psychology goes in a lot more in depth. So please do read. My slides you know, are helpful as a general summary, but please don't use it um, you know, as the only resource for your exams. Consult your textbook. Look at the syllabus in your textbook and see the studies that are quoted there. Go and find those studies on the internet. Read those studies. Go and find out you know, more from other resources and online materials. What can you learn about CBT therapy, REBT therapy, ECT, right? understand those therapies so that in your exam you can talk more about it. Right? Uh, you, you feel free to follow me on social media. My Instagram is at magicross7. Uh, do help me out by liking, commenting and subscribing to my channel. That really helps me a long way as I build my YouTube channel. Also, if you feel uh, generous, you are uh, more than welcome to donate to me at paypal.me slash magicross7. If you live in Malaysia, like me, you can actually uh, email me and find out, or message me on Instagram, find out my uh, bank details uh, for Malaysians to transfer. Or if you want to do a bank wire transfer, that's well as well. That's good. That's fine as well. Again, this is only if you feel um, like you have the financial capacity to donate. If you're a student and you're living on a tight budget and you don't have money to donate, that's absolutely fine. Please don't force yourself um, to donate. This is completely optional, right? Um, thank you so much for listening and. Um, Please subscribe and stay tuned to my future videos.